All right. You guys ready? I realized as I got here, I don't think I sent out an announcement about the session. So that may be part of the reason there's only five of you here. I did write it on the whiteboard. So I mean, if you were in class, you were told. But yeah, I know people get confused when I forget to send out an announcement, since I always do. So that's my bad. Um, we're going to talk about, obviously, development today. Here's some memes to get you started off right. I'm sorry, but your wife didn't make it. Bring me the one my wife made. So, I gotta start with a smile. Three of you smiled. Good enough. It's over half of you. Biology fact for the day is that uh, king cobras produce enough neurotoxin to kill an elephant with one single bite, but you can also use synthetic cobra venom as a painkiller. So obviously, you know, in the right doses with the right mixture of other things in it, you can actually use uh, cobra venom to treat pain and arthritis. So that's pretty wild. We actually do experiments with cobra venom here at the university, so that's pretty sweet. Uh, the study tip is to prioritize, right? And this, you, you can interpret this in a lot of ways. Prioritize your most difficult classes or prioritize the most difficult concepts that you'll see on a test. Even just prioritizing your time in general, you know, how much time do you need to sleep, how much time do you need to go to class, how much time do you need to be at work, how much time do you need to do homework, right? Just the ability to prioritize will make studying and learning and doing well so much easier because you're not spending unnecessary amounts of time on unnecessary things. So if you feel like you're just, you don't have enough time, you're always running out of time, you're always down to the last minute and just you, you just feel like you never get a break, maybe take a minute to look at your schedule and figure out, am I spending too much time on things that I don't need? All right. So first off, I'll start with, there was a question in Monday's session about this graph and whether or not it was like a positive feedback loop turning into a negative feedback loop and then a negative or like, you know, vice versa. And there was some general confusion with this graphic, basically. Um, so I went and watched the Panopto recording, and um, it doesn't come up at all. So the short answer is it doesn't matter. Whether or not it's positive, negative, or positive to negative, negative to positive, it doesn't really matter. What you need to understand from this graph for the purposes of the test is hypothalamus secretes GnRH, which then triggers the pituitary to release FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And that is what gets the follicle to develop. Then once the estrogen level's high enough, ovulation begins. And that's, that's really all you have to know about this graph. If you want to know whether it's positive, negative, back and forth, you can know as much as you want to know about this. You can talk to Dr. Bobek and she'll tell you however much you want to know. But for this class and exam two and the final, that's all you have to really know and be able to do. Does that work for you guys? Okay. I did, wasn't going to pass around the roll, but we're starting to get enough people here that it's Probably worth it. It's one sheet of paper, right? So, those are all the slides that I prepared for today because I wanted to just let you guys ask questions or focus on the stuff that you guys want to work on. Because I started making slides and then I realized, at least with today's material, it's a lot of just vocab. And I was basically just copying straight out of her PowerPoints. And so I said, well, it's not really all that productive for me to just copy her PowerPoints. If you guys want to just go through her PowerPoints, that's fine if you think that's what's going to help you the most. I just didn't feel like copying her slides when they're already up. So that's it for that. I don't know why it's doing that. What do you guys want to talk about?
Ja. Definitely. Let's look at it. So, gastrulation and organogenesis. All right, let's start here. First off, tell me what you guys do know about gastrulation. So the three layers she's referring to is ecto, meso, and endoderm. Ecto means what? Outside, right? Meso, middle, endo, inside. Tells you exactly where the three layers are, right? So, and she mentioned um, there's two layers in, in, a, in a simpler organism. Um, a hydra is something like a jellyfish, right? It just has an ecto and endoderm, right? More complex organisms like tryptoblasts, um, planarias like the flatworms that we saw, sea urchins, you guys know what sea urchins are? Um, they'll have, right, all three. So the, the blue, the red, and the yellow correspond to the key over there. Um, but essentially, what is gastrulation? Because it's a process, right? Say, say it one more time. That's definitely part of it, yeah. So the blastopore is this bottom portion. Sorry for panopto watchers. I'm just pointing with a stick. Um, it's, the, it's the opening, right, that allows nutrients in or out. And whether it develops one or two decides, you know, mouth and anus in one or, you know, mouth and anus separate. But... I mean, the idea is the same, nutrients in and out. So yeah, that's definitely a part of it. How does it happen? It may or may not be on the slide. You rearrange the cells, right? So don't forget, don't just because, you know, there's hardly any words or it seems fairly simple, don't. Don't overlook that kind of stuff, right? Honestly, honestly, you could see a question that says gastrulation is, and that's the answer on the test. I mean, that's, that's pretty basic, so you're more likely to see something more complicated, but you never know. I'd say on every 40 question test, there's at least two or three basically gimme questions where it just says gastrulation is, and you would have to know that, right? So does that help with gastrulation? Do you want to look at it in more depth? I think there are other slides. So did you, what else were you confused on with gastrulation? What else did you guys want to talk about? This is basically just showing you on an act, this process on an actual organism, so it's the same thing. And then this, Dr. Bobek even said in class, you're not really expected to know like every single little thing like that the ectoderm has, you know, those four things, and then the mesoderm, those five, and the endoderm, those three, like she's not gonna force you to memorize all that stuff, it, it, there would be no point. You really just have to understand ectoderm's outside, mesoderm's middle, endoderm's inner, 
and then maybe just have a general understanding, for example, where would you find sweat glands? It makes sense that they're on the outside, right? Um, lining of your digestive tract, obviously inside, um, like the very inner layer. And then um, your mesoderm is, you know, like the skeleton and um, the dermis of the skin is referring to the, the middle of the skin, not the epidermis, but the, just the dermis. So just the ability to kind of understand what in general is found in these areas, not so much know each individual thing. Does that make logical sense? If it doesn't, maybe just spend some time thinking through each of these things and trying to figure out why they belong to each one and then you should be in pretty good shape. Um, I don't remember if there are more slides on gastrulation. Oh yeah, so gastrulation in a chick embryo. This is in a, as far as I can tell, in a human, yeah, it's in a human uterus. Um, this again is just kind of be able to understand some logical processes here. So the blastocyst gets into the uterus, right? It's been, it's been ovulated and fertilized, and it actually enters the uterus, right? Um, then it implants into the uterine lining, and then it develops its extra membryonic membranes. You guys remember what extra, extra embryonic membranes are? Part of it. Yeah, definitely nutrition is one of the most important parts of it. Was it those four that you said amnion, Yeah, in fact, I think that's the next slide right here. All right? So the extra embryonic membranes are these four things, right? Amnion is like amniotic fluid. Yolk sac is, you know, like an egg yolk when you crack open an egg. The yellow stuff, the yolk, is like the nutrients, right? But that's not exclusive to eggs. Um, well, it is exclusive to eggs. It's not exclusive to chicken eggs, right? Um, humans have a yolk sac in the egg that they develop with. I don't know if it's yellow. Um, and then these other two are just a, a protective layer as far as what I understood from class. Um, more than anything, I would just know those four names. So if you had a question that said, which of the following is not an extra embryonic membrane, um, you would get these four plus, I don't know, like, Protein. I don't know. I can't think of a fifth non example, but you would get, you know, those four and then one of them that's not, and you'd have to pick that one. Or you would get four that aren't and then one of these, and you have to know that. And maybe you also just have to know um, that the amnion is, you know, like amniotic fluid and that the yolk is for nutrition. Feeling all right up to there? So I guess I didn't finish this last slide all the way. So you develop your um, extrionic, extra embryonic, it's so hard to say, membranes, right, in your third stage. Um, be more or less familiar with the timeline as well. So blastocyst reaches uterus, and then um, seven days after fertilization is when it implants, and then 10 to 11 days, the membranes form, and then at 13 days, gastrulation begins, right? So the layers start to form and you start to get the three distinct layers. And then by the fourth stage, you have the fully formed um, three-layered embryo and it's four extra embryonic membranes. So there's not really a time on that one. Um, it's after 13 days, obviously. You don't have to know that exact date though. Just know that that's the final stage for at least the gastrulation process. There's obviously a lot more to do after that. You have to make a whole baby. 
Okay. Feeling all right with gastrulation then? Because the other half of the question was organogenesis, right? Am I correct on that? That should be right here. So, obviously we don't want to just have an ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, right? Then we would just be a three-layered organism and we wouldn't be much more complex than like a worm, right? We're a little more complex than that. So, we actually form all of our important structures from one of those three layers. Again, this is similar to that list from before, and I think some of it's even, you know, in both lists. You probably don't need to know like every single little one of these, but if you can more or less see the logical reasoning behind why they're, why they're in which group they're in, then you should be in good shape. So if you can, you know, say to yourself, I, I get why, you know, your lung cells and thyroid cells and digestive cells are, you know, that innermost layer. That's, you know, pretty much the dead center of your body as compared to, you know, muscles, which are definitely not the top layer, but they're not necessarily the most central layer either, right? Um, kidneys and red blood cells and, and your uh, smooth muscle of your gut, right? It's not the very innermost layer that you can get to, but it's sort of in between, right? And then the ectoderm turning into like skin and neurons and pigment cells, that's pretty much as far out as you can get, right? Skin and, and the pigment cells in your skin and the neurons of your brain are kind of outer layer stuff, right? So just be able to logically understand where you would get a certain type of structure. You guys cool up to there? So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. I think we have quite a few organogenesis slides, yeah. So break it down for me. What is happening here? Obviously, it's neurulation. Folding like a burrito, yeah. So you have the neural plate, and it literally folds. They call it the neural fold for a reason. And it starts to scrunch up on itself. It eventually scrunches all the way and forms a neural tube, right? And then you have your ectoderm, like your skin or some other layer. What is this neural tube for? Brain and spinal cord, right? That's eventually what it's going to grow into. Um, so that's how the neural tube forms, but how do we get this neural plate to start with? As you're forming, right, your endo, meso, and ectoderm, the neural plate forms on top of the ectoderm and just becomes kind of a, an extra extension of it, and then this happens, right? So this and this are more or less the same thing. Again, apologies to people watching. The recording, they can't see what I'm pointing at. The top of this ball, what color is that, like green? Teal. Teal? <laughs> it's too specific for me. Um, is the same thing as the, the first layer of the four layers that you see. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, another important structure to note is this notochord. Does anybody remember what that is? That's what actually turns into the brain, yes. So the neural tube plus the notochord becomes brain and brain stem spinal cord. Um, that's, yeah, that's it. Multiple questions. No, so is there only one neural tube that forms or is this happening in multiple areas or just in one? I want to say it's just one because it develops one neural tube, and that neural tube itself grows to become the spinal cord and brain. Is there another? So the, what's the difference between the neural plate and the neural fold? The neural fold is this sort of, 
don't really know how to explain it in a super good way. The neural fold is just the next layer out. So the, the neural plate is the dead center. The neural fold is a, almost like the barrier between the ectoderm and the neural plate. And then watch how it like folds in on itself. It's like a really light, I don't even know what color. And then it, it merges on itself and the neural crest cells, I don't even know what they are, so you don't need to know what they are, but they, you know, as, as it folds on itself, this becomes the neural tube and that becomes the neural crest cells and they, they kind of separate from each other. That's the best explanation I can give and about as much as you need to know. <laughs> Questions on this part of organogenesis? No? Okay. Um, making somites. What are somites? Cells that are going to make vertebrae roots and muscles. Yep. Right there. So their, their own distinct structure they're differentiate, well, they're determined. That's what I want to use. They're determined to differentiate into vertebra, ribs, and muscles, right? So they aren't yet those things, but that's the path that they're on. You guys remember undifferentiated, undetermined, determined, all that. Is a mesenchyme like a precursor to a somite? A mesenchyme, I think, comes after, or no, a mesenchyme is a type of somite. Maybe they're all somites. I think somite is the umbrella term, and the mesenchyme is what specifically becomes either vertebra, rib, or muscle. So a mesenchyme is just a type of somite. I don't know what the other somites become. You obviously don't need to know. Um, so, and you can actually even kind of see it going on. So this is the eye, and see how there's a bit of a bulge there? That's literally going to become an eyeball, right? And the tail bud, obviously, we just, you know, that's like the, that's our coccyx. Um, in other animals, that, you know, becomes an actual tail. But you can actually kind of see a rib-like structure in the side of the organism. So it, I don't even know how far along in development this is, but it's, pretty early on because we don't even have an actual eye yet, right? And already that structure's ready to go. Why? Isn't your heart about to be formed in there so it would make sense to have something protected or it Yeah, it's the, it's the, why can't I think, foundation, right? Everything, not everything, most of our organs are going to be inside of that rib cage and what are vertebra? Protect your spinal cord, right? They're the individual links down the chain of your spine. You want to form that pretty early, right? You're a lot less likely to damage your spinal cord if you have vertebra around it, right? And then muscles, um, they're just going to give structure to the actual body, right? I'm not sure what your question is. The neural cord? Oh, right. Yeah. So is that going to just like shift all the way up to where the head should be to become the brain? Or is it running all the way through the, the organism? I mean, with, with this drawing here, I'm not even sure like what the next step is. but. You really just need to understand that the notochord and the neural tube become the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord. I don't know 
who shifts where or at what stage, and you don't really need to either. It's really just an understanding of what they are and what they'll become. That's what I would fo focus on more. You guys up to speed with this part? Questions? Confusion? If you're, if you're not getting it, it's OK. It takes a while. This is a lot of vocab, a lot of you know, graphs and drawings and a lot of new words, and that's fine. You know, you have till, I think, like the 25th or 26th when the test opens. So you have, like, a few weeks. Keep studying this. You keep working on it. Um, it'll come eventually. And obviously, you're welcome to ask questions at any point, even if, like, tomorrow you're studying and you're like, wait, what's this? You can message me or ask Hillary in her session. Or if three weeks from now you're about to take the test, as long as the test isn't open, you can always ask. It's never like, oops, we already covered it, right? Um, this is just an example of how it would happen in a, in a chick embryo. Notice that it's, it's pretty much the same deal, right? There's some slight variation. Um, I honestly don't anticipate there being like a specific question about the specific organogenesis in chick as compared to anything else. I think this was just to show you, again, you know, neural tube and notochord are found around here. The somite, right, is kind of off to the sides of it. And then you just, you still have your three traditional layers and you, you get the yolk and all that, right? This is just to, to show you it's all the same stuff. Um, and yeah, you just, it's kind of cool. You can see all of those developing. Um, interestingly enough, this is more or less also how a human looks. Pretty much all animals look the same for the first like couple of weeks of development because we all have the same base plan, right? Brain, brain stem, spinal cord, ribs, uh, vital organs, limbs, right? And so it all starts pretty much the same, which is kind of weird. beans. I think that's it for organogenesis. Yeah, then there's morphogenesis, which is its own thing. So that's a very long way of answering your question about organogenesis and what was the other one called? Morphogenesis. <laughs> so, what else? This slide? Yeah. So what, what, were, what was the confusion for you? Well, the whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> More or less. I was just kind of confused on the ability to create muscles, or is this just how they had them kind of? The gist behind this slide, so ectoderm, outer layer, right? Mm -hmm. You guys remember the neural plate? It starts to kind of bend in, and then um, the neural fold will be, you know, somewhere around here, and you kind of come in on yourself, and it pinches off and forms that neural tube. Um, I think maybe the only thing different here to notice is the cuboidal ectodermal cells is a fancy way of saying outer layer, whether that's skin or the cortex of your brain or whatever it's going to become. And then microtubules and actin filaments are just involved in, in your muscles. Um, so these necessarily don't necessarily have to become muscles, but it's part of how the folding works. Because actin and microtubules are what allow things to move. So that the pinching here that you're seeing is done by the actin and microtubules bending. Or it's a little more complex than that, but essentially, they fold in on themselves. So I, I think that's really the only difference here. It's it's still a repeat of the neural folding and all that, but just with that extra detail. Does that clarify for you then? Yeah. Okay. What else? What do you guys want to talk about? We still have twenty minutes. We can talk about 
previous stuff, not necessarily just from today. I don't think that's in re Oh, I'm still, that's why. Um, that's probably under reproduction. I have a hard time remembering where they're found. You're not talking about so much the HPG axis, are you? No. Keep you were looking for these ones? No, keep going. Oh, okay. So these ones. Yes. So we looked at this on the, in the session on Monday, but it's definitely worth looking at again. Why? She brought it up like five times. There was like 600 clicker questions on it. It's a pretty good indicator. I mean, you're not going to get a more obvious sign that this is important and test worthy than like three lectures, all including bits and pieces from it. So since we already talked about it on Monday, I'm going to let you guys remind me how it works. So first off, I w in fact, I won't even guide you guys. Start, just start pointing out things that you think are important from this slide. Yeah? For the follicular phase and the mature end portion, right there, yeah, is that when it's mature, when it matures, is when the estradiol actually increases or comes into effect? It's kind of in between. So the increase in estradiol starts to occur as you go from the not fully matured to the, the stage of maturation right before ovulation. So it's kind of during, if that makes sense. You guys have other questions? Other? So does the follicle release the estradiol? The estradiol is a uh, hormone. So where do hormones come from? The pituitary, right? Um, I don't remember if it's anterior or posterior for estradiol. That might be something to check in your notes. But it's coming from the pituitary and going to the follicle. That's what helps take it from mature follicle to ovulation. What else do you guys see? Either stuff that you don't know or stuff that you do know. Either one works for me. What does LH stand for? First off, what does LH stand for? Luteinizing hormone, okay. Um, where, so it, it's a pretty narrow peak, right? We don't have hardly any luteinizing hormone across the board except right there in the middle. So what does that tell you? Ovulation. Stimulates ovulation, right? You notice it lines straight up with ovulation. You get that peak in luteinizing hormone, and that's what actually starts the ovulation. A way that I remember that is the luteal phase is right after ovulation. So essentially, luteinizing hormone is what's pushing us into the luteal phase, right? Because the, the, the purpose of ovulation is then to form the corpus luteum, right? Does that make sense? Okay. What else do you guys see? So is it the low progesterone levels that cause menstruation? Essentially, yeah. So progesterone increases, increases, increases as this corpus luteum is developing, right? But if it's not fertilized, that's when the degeneration occurs, right? And so as the degeneration occurs, progesterone goes back down, and then this should continue, this lower third um, would continue, and the uterine lining drops off, which in and of itself is menstruation. So it's slightly more complex than that, but basically as progesterone drops, uterine lining thins and menstruation occurs. So if we didn't have degeneration, what would happen? We're going to plane off, right? Progesterone's going to just stay constant. So we don't have this dip. It would just stay there. Why? 
Right, we're, the, the organism's pregnant, so we don't want to thin the uterine lining. The purpose of the uterine lining is to give the fertilized egg somewhere to implant and grow. So we keep the progesterone constant, we would keep this thickness constant, right? So it becomes from a follicle to a corpuscle, it becomes, is that the name of it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just looking at the slide that's a couple above this, it does look like the extra dial is produced by the follicle, which then tells the pituitary to release the LH. So I have it backwards? You're saying here it does? Okay, yes, I lied to you then. Good catch. So estradiol comes out of the follicle as it develops. That's what tells the hypothalamus, hey, I'm fully developed. And then the uh, hypothalamus tells the follicle then it's time for ovulation. I couldn't think of the word. Good catch. Thank you. Other questions? I don't necessarily think there's anything else all that important. What's FSH? Follicle stimulating hormone, so if you had to guess what it does. Stimulates the follicle. What does that mean though? It makes it grow. Takes it from, you know, follicular phase to luteal phase. The corpus luteum is, from my understanding, uh, the protective kind of outer layer around the egg. Yeah, so this, this middle bit, I think you said it was pink, is the egg. The corpus luteum is that shell on it, I guess. I'm not following you, to be honest. So the follicle stays in the ovary, and the egg is released into the... Yeah, I don't think the corpus luteum is the egg. Go up like three slides. See, this is why they should have taught this to me when I took the class. So you're saying... What you guys are seeing is we have the oocyte in the follicle, the follicle grows, we get a fully matured follicle, it ruptures, which is ovulation, and then the corpus luteum degenerates. Okay, then I definitely misunderstood that. Thank you for catching that. So this is the follicle, and it the egg is ejected from the follicle and then the corpus luteum eventually dies off. And then, you know, next month it does it all over again. So for the FSH, it is what caused the ejaculation or did the growth start, causes the start of the growth of the corpus luteum degenerates? The follicle stimulating hormone is what causes the egg to leave. It stim and you can think about it as it stimulates the follicle to send out the egg, whereas the luteinizing hormone is then responsible for the corpus luteum and everything following. The follicle stimulating hormone, yes. All good up to there? I'm sorry I keep getting some of this stuff wrong. <laughs> I, I literally have never heard this stuff before until the same time as you guys, so I'm giving it my best shot. Don't, make you, don't let that make you think that the rest of the semester is going to be awful. This is the only chapter that I didn't learn. The rest of them, I'm like, all right, I know what's going on. So, And in fact, some of the chapters coming up were some of my favorite chapters. So that'll be a good time. Right now, it's just we're doing the best we can. 
Um, other than that, I, I think that's all the key stuff from this graph that you need to understand. You guys have questions on other parts from here? Other things that are confusing you? Other vocab words that you want to watch me get wrong? No? All right, what else do you want to look at then? I think we still have probably like 10 minutes. 10 minutes on the dot. So just to understand, for the progesterone, that basically controls, does it control the menstrual or the uterine cycle? It's more related to the thickness of the uterine lining. So as progesterone increases, thickness of uterine lining increases. As progesterone decreases, thickness decreases. But that being said, that still is obviously related to the menstrual cycle because as it goes down, that is menstruation. So it's kind of, it's both, but it's more, the, the direct relationship is progesterone increase and decrease is directly related to uterine lining increase and decrease. The secondary relationship is that obviously is the menstrual cycle. Does that answer that? Okay. What else do you guys want to look at? Nothing. Let me see if there's anything that I feel like we really should talk about from this, what we covered today. So we already looked at all this. We looked at morphogenesis. Um, you definitely need to understand the idea of convergent extension, right? Is this how blue cells kind of jam themselves into the red cells and the red cells jam themselves into the blue cells? Excuse me. <clears throat> and then, you know, by shoving themselves into each other, they push each other apart. So that's, you know, convergent means they converge on each other, they, they stick into each other. And then extension means as they stick into each other, that pushes them away from each other. You guys already know apoptosis is cell death, but how does apoptosis relate to hands? Yeah, we all have webbing between our fingers as we develop. Right, because the hand starts as just a, a nothing, a little nub, and then it, you know, it eventually kind of grows out and out and out, but there's still some webbing between our fingers. So apoptosis, those, the, those cells die, right? That's apoptosis. So the webbing between your fingers just dies and goes away, right? And that's not exclusive to hands. That happens in a lot of places. Um, and then cell migration is exactly what it sounds like. Um, cell adhesion molecules is just molecules that adhese or stick to cells and extracellular matrix, right? So it's just how the cells stick together and stick to the extracellular matrix, which is like the skeleton for, you know, basic units. Um, the fate map of the frog was just, again, what we've already looked at a bunch of times. Definitely know these vocab terms, dorsal top, ventral bottom. I like to think, you know, the dorsal fin is on a shark, right? And that's on his top. And then vents would be on the bottom, so ventral. And then obviously posterior, most of us understand that's, you know, back. And then anterior is front. And then right and left, pretty standard. Um, you have to know bilateral symmetry means the left and right halves are identical. And then asymmetrical means that the, you know, the front to back and top to bottom are asymmetrical. So are we bilaterally symmetrical? Yes, my right arm and my left arm are symmetrical, right? My right leg and my left leg, symmetrical. But are we also this type of asymmetrical? No. No, why not? Right, head and feet, different from each other. Um, chest and back, or knees and back of knees, you know, so our front and back, is it like a knee pit? I don't know what that's called. There's a, probably a real anatomical term. I call it the knee pit. Um, 
yeah, so no, be, be familiar with those kind of directional vocab terms and then the bilateral, bilateral symmetry and then the dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior asymmetry. Um, yeah, we won't worry about that. What else do you guys want to talk about? You want to call it a day, five minutes early? All right, sounds good. Thank you for coming. Did everybody get a chance to sign the roll? It's up here, so if you need to come sign it, come and grab it. <laughs>